This is Savita Power again, uh, inviting you to attend day two of the EHE Symposium. And we are going to start with an amazing success story in preventing HIV transmission from our first speaker, Dr. Lynn Morfinson. Dr. Morfinson is a board certified pediatric infectious disease specialist and received her MD with honors from Albert Einstein uh, College of Medicine. She trained in infectious diseases at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and served for four years as Assistant Commissioner, Division of Communicable Disease Control at the Massachusetts Depart Department uh, uh, of Public Health. She then joined NICHD at, in, at NIH in 1989 to direct the pediatric and maternal HIV research at a time when pediatric HIV was emerging as a serious threat worldwide. She spent 26 years directing research on the prevention and treatment of pediatric and maternal HIV infection in the US and globally before retiring from the NIH. Currently, she serves as Senior HIV Technical Advisory for the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation, where she is involved in research evaluating the implementation of many of the interventions she studied while at NIH. On a personal note, I came to know Dr. Morfinson almost from the day she started out at NICHD. I have learned much from her and owe her a debt of gratitude for her guidance and collaboration, especially when I was leading an NICHD funded pediatric HIV clinical trial site in New York. I can say without hesitation that the success in eliminating mother to child transmission in no small measure is due to her research direction and insight. I can also say with confidence, as you will see from her presentation, that no one knows the field or can present it better than Dr. Martinson. Thank you, Lynn, and welcome. And, Thanks, and also, uh, before you start, a reminder to the audience that if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So, Lynn. Yeah, thanks, thank Savita, for the very kind introduction. Um, I am going to speak this morning about the evolution of pediatric HIV infection in the United States. So, the first cases of pediatric AIDS were reported to the CDC in 1982, about 18 months after the first case report in adults. And initially, this was in pediatric hemophiliacs and transfusion recipients, but then in children without such risk factors. And then by 1983, reports of AIDS among children born to parents with recognized risk factors for AIDS were published from New York, New Jersey, and Miami. By the late 1980s, one in every four HIV-infected mothers transmitted HIV to their infant. And it was recognized that most pediatric infection occurred through transmission from mother to child, although the timing of transmission in utero versus intrapartum was unclear. And by the early 1990s, more than 16,000 perinatally infected children had been born in the US with a critical need for prevention. However, there were no specific interventions to prevent transmission other than for a woman to know her HIV status, and if infected, to not get pregnant. Additionally, untreated HIV in children had extremely high mortality, and this graph ref reflects data from Gwen Scott's cohort in Miami, showing 25% mortality by age two years. In 1987, the HIV treatment era began with the approval of AZT for treatment. So given the availability of AZT, the association of transmission with viral load, and the very high mortality of pediatric AIDS, pediatric and obstetric researchers proposed giving AZT to infected pregnant women to reduce MTCT. However, giving a potentially toxic drug to pregnant women and exposing their fetuses was highly controversial at that time, and the FDA had to hold a public meeting to discuss the ethics of giving AZT to pregnant women before allowing the 076 trial to move forward. So the AZT regimen in the 076 trial was designed to target multiple time points of transmission, 
in a kind of kitchen sink approach, figuring we only had one chance to get this right. It was given orally during pregnancy after 14 weeks gestation to target in utero infection occurring after the first trimester. And because of rapid transplacental passage, it was given intravenously interpartum to the mother to ensure that drug was present in the infant as pre-exposure prophylaxis prior to maximal exposure um, during passage through the birth canal to the virus. And then finally, it was given to the infant for six weeks postpartum to provide post-exposure prophylaxis against any virus that might have entered the infant during labor and delivery. The Data and Safety Monitoring Board stopped the trial in February 1994 at the first interim analysis when it found transmission was 8% with AZT compared to 26% with placebo, a remarkable 67% reduction, and providing the first demonstration of treatment as prevention. Following the trial results, there was rapid national implementation of the 076 regimen. Within weeks, a public health task force was formed and interim guidance were issued. Within six months, final guidelines were issued and the FDA gave the drug approval. Um, and this is the only drug approved for PMTCT and this happened prior to the publication. And by the end of the year, Medicaid coverage was required for AZT, um, for PMTCT in all states. And this slide demonstrates the rapid translation of the trial results into practice. The graph looks at the number of infected infants born annually in the US. And within three years of the results, there was a 65% reduction in new perinatal infections only three years and an 88% reduction within 10 years. So what have we learned in the post-AZT era? By the early 2000s, data from the Women and Infants Transmission Study demonstrated that heart reduced, uh, resulted in lower transmission rates than AZT alone as seen in the circles in the figure on the left. And we learned that viral load and type of regimen were independently associated with transmission as seen in the figure on the right with the lowest transmission rates with combination ART and viral suppression. And the PROMISE trial definitively demonstrated the superiority of combination ART for prevention of transmission, even among women with high CD4 counts. The antepartum component of this trial enrolled women with CD4 over 350, and they were randomized to start either triple ART or AZT single dose nevirapine after the first trimester. And you can see while transmission was only 1.8% with AZT single dose nevirapine, triple ART further reduced this to 0.6%. And in the US since the late 1990s, there's been an increase in the use of combination ART in pregnancy over time. And these are data from the pediatric HIV AIDS cohort study, including 22 sites in the US, looking at antiretroviral drug use by pregnant HIV infected women. And you can see by 2009, 97% of women were receiving combination regimens, 88% of which were combination three drug regimens. We've learned that treatment duration affects the efficacy and prevention with longer treatment being more effective. And these are data from the French perinatal cohort evaluating the association of transmission with the timing of treatment and delivery viral load. So for women starting ART during pregnancy, the highest transmission rates, 2.2%, were when starting treatment in the third trimester. And regardless of duration, the lowest transmission rates were with low viral load. And preconception treatment had the greatest efficacy. Among over 2,600 women on treatment preconception who had viral load less than 50 through delivery, there were no transmissions. Thus, in this situation where the mother is on preconception art and maintains suppressed viral load throughout pregnancy, 
undetectable may equal untransmissible for perinatal transmission. However, even if you were on preconception art, you do see transmission if there's a higher viral load at delivery. And in the US, there's been an increase over time in use of art at conception. These are data from over 1,500 HIV positive women in the fact study evaluating art use between 2008 and 2017. And overall, 42% of women were receiving treatment at conception in blue. 34% um, uh, were previously treated and resuming during pregnancy in green, and 24% had started treatment for the, uh, the first time during pregnancy. And if we look over time, you can see that the rate of use in conception at blue increased from 38% in 2008 to 56% uh, by 2016. And given this, we're nearing virtual elimination of new perinatal infections in the US. The CDC has defined elimination as an incidence of less than one per 100,000 births and an MTCT rate of less than 1%. And in the graph, you can see the incidence of perinatal HIV peaked in 1992 at 43.1 per 100,000. And by 2015, the incidence of perinatal HIV had declined to 1.3 per 100,000, a 97% decline since peak, near but not quite at elimination. So can we reach virtual elimination of perinatal HIV in the US? So if we look at the most recent data through 2018, new perinatal infections have decreased from 141 in 2014 to only 65 in 2018. However, significant racial ethnic disparities exist with perinatal infection rates per 100,000 significantly higher among African-American women in green than Hispanic or white women. And this disparity is likely related to social determinants. And a study in Philadelphia looked at the effect of neighborhood factors such as poverty, education level, crime, and social uh, capital on viral suppression. And women residing in neighborhoods with high rates of crime, the red circles, were more likely to have poor virologic control while women in neighborhoods with higher rates of education, the blue circle, we're more likely to have good virologic control. So where are the new perinatal infections occurring? And the map shows you the incidence per 100,000 live births between 2010 and 2013 in colors. And the numbers show you the distribution of the 367 infections that occurred during those periods. Nine states had an incidence of two to 3.9 and seven states had uh, incidence of four or higher per 100,000. And of the 16 states with an incidence of two or more, 10 were in the South. And even if you look at more recent data from 2016, you see the this, this same Southern predominance in new infections. So what are the major barriers to elimination in the US? And this slide shows you common barriers associated with residual transmission in 12 papers published in the R era. And these include acute infection during pregnancy, late or no prenatal care, late HIV testing, no treatment or short duration treatment, uh, lack of viral suppression, maternal substance use, and breastfeeding. And these all have a common pathway. They impact on achieving viral suppression during pregnancy and hence on risk of perinatal transmission. So acute infection in pregnancy does occur in the US and is associated with increased transmission. In New York in 2002 to 2006, over 3,100 HIV exposed mothers and infants were identified through newborn screening. 41 or 1.3% had acute infection during pregnancy with transmission 22% with acute infection compared to 1.8% like infection. 
uh, in 15 sites conducting enhanced perinatal surveillance between 2005 and 2010 of over 10,000 pregnant HIV positive women giving birth, 124 or 1.2%, zero converted during pregnancy, and rates of transmission were eightfold higher with acute compared to chronic infection. Late HIV testing results in no or very short duration of antepartum treatment and increased transmission. And in an analysis of timing of maternal HIV testing in children with perinatal infection on the left and without perinatal infection on the right, you can see that late diagnosis of HIV was clearly associated with the risk of infection. 79% of uninfected infants were born to mothers who knew their status prior to pregnancy, compared to only 38% in infants who were infected. Now, knowledge of HIV status is critical to start on treatment and obtain viral suppression. So what do we know about testing in the United States? So while universal prenatal testing is recommended in the US, these data show that it's not yet reality. And these are data from the Pregnancy Risk Assessment Monitoring System Survey on prenatal HIV testing between 2004 and 2011 in 35 uh, states in New York City. In over 325,000 women with recent live births during that time period, overall prenatal testing was 75.7% below the recommendation for universal testing. And you can see in the graph that this did not improve over time. And if you look at state level data, you can see there is a wide range in testing rates from 43 to 93%. And the nine states with the little red circles have no prenatal testing laws and generally have lowest rates of prenatal testing. So in addition to routine first antenatal care visit prenatal testing, repeat HIV testing in the third trimester to detect seroconversion is important to identify acutely infected women and start treatment immediately but despite studies showing this is cost effective, even in low prevalence settings, retesting is not widely implemented. So this is from a study of state laws in 2016. And while 18 states had regulations related to retesting in the third trimester, only eight states in hot pink had comprehensive regulations, including third trimester retesting, testing at labor and or of the newborn if the mother status was unknown. An additional nine states in green addressed only testing in labor or newborn when maternal status was unknown. And five states in yellow had very non-specific regulations. So almost half of states in 2016 had no requirements for retesting or even testing when uh, unknown maternal HIV status. Now, given the risk of perinatal transmission with acute infection, the use of PrEP to prevent infection in women who are pregnant is important. And in 2015, CDC estimated that 468,000 women in the US were at significant risk of acquiring HIV and could benefit from PrEP. However, PrEP use by women in the US is low and using data from a national prescription database looking at new PrEP starts between 2014 and 2017, of 128,000 new PrEP starts, females accounted for only 9% in 2017. And 33% of women starting PrEP were African-American but 59% of females diagnosed with HIV in 2017 were African-American. Now the time of HIV diagnosis and inadequate prenatal care both correlate with receipt of treatment and viral outcome in pregnant women. And these are data from the Philadelphia Enhanced Perinatal Surveillance analyzing data from 656 pregnant women 25% were first diagnosed during pregnancy and 23% had inadequate prenatal care. And in the figures below, the blue represents receipt of treatment 
and the orange represents viral suppression. And both initial diagnosis during pregnancy, the red box on the left, and inadequate prenatal care, the red box on the right, were associated with significantly lower rates of both ART initiation and viral suppression. This study from the CDC looked at the perinatal cascade among HIV exposed infants on the top and those who became infected, the table on the bottom, from a number of different surveillance sources in the US between 2005 and 2014. So as we've already discussed, HIV infected infants are often born to mothers with inadequate prenatal care and who are less likely to receive treatment. And an additional risk factor is breastfeeding. Now breastfeeding by HIV infected women who do not know their HIV status and hence are not on treatment is a significant risk factor for transmission to their infant with an overall risk of transmission of 40%, as high as 40% in a breastfeeding infant. Now in the US, HIV infected women are advised to formula feed their infant even if they're on treatment. However, some are questioning whether an HIV positive women on treatment who's fully suppressed might um, choose to breastfeed. So what do we know about risk with treatment? In the postpartum component of PROMISE, mother-baby pairs were randomized to infant nevirapine in the dashed lines or maternal ART in the solid line for the duration of breastfeeding. And you can see postnatal infection rates were very low, only 0.6% at 12 months of age with no significant difference by study arm. And in this study, viral load was measured at baseline 6, 14, 26, and 50 weeks postpartum. So time varying maternal viral load during pregnancy was significantly associated with infant infection in the maternal ART arm, but not the infant nevirapine arm. And of seven postnatal infections in the maternal ART arm, two had plasma RNA less than 40 copies per ml in the visit prior to the infection diagnosis. In one case, all maternal prior viral loads were suppressed, and in the other, the viral load just prior to infection was suppressed, but, but was between 50 and uh, 1,000 at week six. Thus, for breast milk transmission, U did not equal U, but was associated with an extremely low risk of transmission. Based on analysis of missed opportunities for prevention of uh, HIV in the US, the CDC has developed a framework for elimination, including primary HIV prevention for uninfected women, including PrEP, assurance of family planning to avoid unplanned pregnancies, accessible prenatal care, universal prenatal testing, provision of ART to all who are HIV positive and ARV prophylaxis to their infant, cesarean delivery if maternal viral load is not suppressed, and discussion of avoidance of breastfeeding. But I do want to point out that the perinatal guidelines, while noting breastfeeding is not recommended in the US, now also provide guidance on harm reduction recommendations if a woman does choose to breastfeed, include being, including being full on fully suppressive treatment with frequent viral load monitoring. So in summary, we're now nearly 40 years past the recognition of perinatal HIV and about a decade after the initial recognition, a successful intervention was identified to reduce transmission, the results of which were implemented nationwide within a year. And within three years of implementation, perinatal infections had decreased by 66%, within 10 years by 90%, and currently by more than 97%. So while we're eliminating, nearing uh, elimination of perinatal transmission in the US, we are not quite there yet. And elimination is going to require accessing the most difficult to reach populations and will also require ad addressing socioeconomic disparities in healthcare for pregnant women. And thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you, Lynn, for that masterful presentation. 
I wanted to start off by asking you about the breastfeeding uh, question. Uh -huh. I'm sure it's on many people's minds with such a low transmission. Uh, do you know what the other nations, developed nations in the world and uh, other less developed nations in the world uh, are recommending? Could you just comment on that? Yeah, so um, the, the British guidelines are similar to the US guidelines and actually came out with their recommendations a little bit before. Uh, and basically, people are discouraging breastfeeding, but recognizing that women may want to breastfeed for a number of different reasons. And given full viral suppression, that that risk is extremely low and can be decided on by conversations of the mother with the provider. So in Britain, they have very similar recommendations. So I think that um, many... Uh, developed countries, Canada as well, have moved towards being a bit more permissive with breastfeeding with, you know, an informed discussion with the mother so that she realizes that it may not be a 0% risk, but it is a very low risk if she stays on her treatment and is suppressed. Okay, and, and uh, but in uh, uh, the de developing world, we still recommend breastfeeding, right? Yes, yes. Um, I think there was one question about, uh, do you know if the, uh, by, from Dr. Cook, uh, do you know if uh, the incidence of transmission uh, on new baby infections was 0% in Florida? Do you know that? Uh, no, I didn't know that, but I... No, I, he's I, asking. Oh, do I know? No, I don't know. I know that in Washington, D.C., we had been at 0% for about five years and then had a, a sudden influx of three to four new infections. So I think it's, you know, it, it's like other infectious diseases. You really can't stop your attention to prevention. Otherwise things come back. Uh, oh. So I don't know how you're doing, how you, you must know Savita how things are in Miami. No, so Anna Puga just uh, replied, it was zero in Florida in 2019. Ah, good. But as you say, uh, you know, it can be zero for five years and suddenly you may get something. I think something like that happened here. Anna, I know you've been following this very closely. Uh, I think there was a little spike. Uh, oh, so for first time ever, it is zero in Florida in 2019. Okay. So we were having one or two get by, I think. Um, yeah, it's important to look at each of these missed opportunities and try to figure out where the missed opportunity was to be able to better target interventions to prevent those things in the future. So, um, I'm wondering if you had any suggestions about, you know, how do we get to these populations who are just not uh, either being coming late in pregnancy and not getting the benefit of ART? You know? uh, if I had the answer, um, mm -hmm. we would be at zero in the US, right? Um, there have been a number of different things that people have done and um, Integration of care with other things like for injection drug users, uh, testing and integration of prenatal care and in, into those kind of situations has had some success. I think Philadelphia has a pretty good model. Um, I, I, I think it really is individual and it will be based on your region and what, where, the, where the problems are in your region. So I don't have any specific guidance for people other than, than that I think a number of these infections are occurring due to our healthcare system and the socioeconomic disparities that exist. And we've noticed that with COVID-19, we've noticed that with births in, in uh, women who are African-American and resolving that may go a long way towards helping us get to zero. Yeah, okay, yeah, great answer. Thank you so much, Lynn, again, for this wonderful presentation.
I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Steve Safran to introduce our next speaker. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome and um, thank you for the prior talk. That was uh, really informative. It is my great pleasure to introduce one of the one of my most favorite people in the world and also an amazing scholar. I was gonna say emerging scholar, but I think she's emerged, definitely. Um, but Dr. Sunisha Dale is an assistant professor in psychology at the University of Miami. She has experience treating trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder. She's the founder of the SHINE research program here at um, UM and was previously an assistant professor in behavioral medicine at Mass General Hospital, where we worked together also, uh, and Harvard Medical School. Her research interests are on enhancing the relationships between resilience, trauma, and health outcomes among individuals at risk for HIV and those uh, living with HIV. She looks at things like microaggressions, discrimination, structural factors like poverty as they relate to health disparities and developing effective prevention and intervention strategies to promote resilience and good health outcomes among survivors of trauma and individuals uh, at risk for H, sorry, uh, at risk for HIV, especially members of racial minority and gender and sexual minority groups who are heavily burdened by the epidemic. Um, she is a co-investigator and, um, well, now core director for CHARM in the uh, Mental Health Disparities Core, uh, and um, she is multiple PI on our T32 that we're about to get funded, we hope. And she's doing really amazing work in the community, for the community, with the community, reciprocal community work that you are about to hear of. And, and Charm and CIFAR are really proud of um, the work that Dr. Dale is going to be talking about through the uh, EHG supplements. Thanks for that awesome introduction, Steve. I want to say it's 99 percent true. I don't think I'm one of your most favorite people. You know, I hope Bill and the kids come before me. But, <laughs> but no, well, thank you so much. Um, so thanks for having me, everyone. I'm going to share my screen and um, give you an overview of the Five Point Initiative, which is a supplement um, that is administered by Charm and funded by NIMH. Okay, and so um, the five point initiative, I'm gonna give you an overview of the first year and some of our findings from that, and then talk a bit about the two years. So it's been funded twice. There was initial planning um, supplement grant um, through the EHA, and then now it's funded um, as a two year expansion of that. I'm the primary guest investigator, but there are multiple people who are at the table um, in terms of doing this work. And so on the first side, I'm acknowledging our community consultants. Um, there are five community consultants in total who are very entrenched in the community um, and informs the project and our process. The primary pillars here are diagnose and respond, although because of the fact that we engage in diagnose and respond, we're also um, impacting the other pillars in terms of um, engagement and um, linkage to treatment and also in terms of reach um, the neighborhoods and places that we go. We also have many implementation partners. So we partner with, um, I would say at this point, it's over 10 community-based health organizations and also the Department of Health, um, just in terms of how the model works. It brings together um, different implementation partners to the table as well. And in summary, what the Five Point um, Initiative is doing is that we partner with um, businesses in communities. And these businesses range from businesses that serve um, food like corner stores, um, small groceries, small restaurants, and also businesses that um, provide other essential services like laundromats. Um, we also do um, car washes and car related places. So car wash, tire, et cetera. Um, and also beauty related places like um, beauty um, stores and barbershops and um, hair salons that predominantly um, are, are frequented by black individuals. And we do this within um, 12 um, zip codes. We initially started off with the one-year project targeting the five most high-impact HIV zip codes within Miami. And then the two-year project has allowed us to expand this to the 12 um, top high-impact HIV zip codes 
in regards to the prevalence among black individuals. And we, so we collaborate with all these entities, the consultants, um, the community-based health organizations, my team and the businesses and conduct these types of events where we're able um, to then provide certain key things and measure certain outcomes. This is a picture of um, members of SHINE. Um, this picture is actually now dated clearly to pre-COVID, but we also have many new members on the team as well. Um, and I put that picture and the bullets here to say that the work that we do for the Five Point Initiative is very much embedded in um, the pillar and kind of the values within SHINE. Um, again, um, Steve Stafford kind of summarized some of the things that we do, but we're very much um, entrenched in doing reciprocal um, engage work with individuals who are um, from community, informed by community, um, passionate about community, and really making it um, impactful science. In regards to the Five Point Initiative, this is the model that you see here on your left is um, the model that was bred out of the first year and how we think about doing this work. And so you could see that the key partnership and voices in the, um, the gray portion there includes my research team, the community consultants, residents in terms of consistently getting their feedback and how we're doing and what needs to be tweaked, the community health organizations and the community businesses. And then the venues are here that I just talked about that we um, partner with and we're doing this within high impact um, zip codes. On the right, you see a map there um, of um, the zip codes within Miami-Dade. And if it's red, that means over 500 individuals who identify as Black or African-American or living with HIV there. And so this is, um, that's the type of data that we use to inform what zip codes we actually go into and partner with business. These, these are images of the community consultants in case the names on the first slide didn't ring a bell, but they are essential and important to the mission. Um, for instance, each of them have individually over 20 years of doing work in the context of HIV um, and doing it along different intersectional um, pieces like Kat Kalimpia and Nunnally have done a lot of work in Miami around um, women and girls. Um, Gina has done it around um, women and girls, but also adolescents, um, young boys, um, young girls. Um, George Gibson has done this a lot from the aspect of being um, he's in ministry, but also um, has done a lot of things in perspective to um, individuals who use substances, um, you know, a lot of prior work in harm reduction techniques, um, and also um, thinking about it in terms of the intersection of what it means for LGBTQ identified individuals. Roxana Bolden on the upper um, right hand corner has had her own individual kind of um, self funded um, outreach ministry to individuals who are um, homeless within the Miami area. And so she comes at this work a lot from there. And then um, Alicia um, Chamel has been doing a lot of work um, through Positive People's Network to focus on individuals with HIV um, in general. But again, a wealth of knowledge. These are just images of some of the community businesses that we partnered with during the first year. You could see it's pre-COVID, so there's no mask there. Um, but this, these are just types of, some of the types of the venues that we've been able to um, outreach, recruit, and then they've engaged with us. These are images of community partners. Like I said, there are a lot of people at the table, so, so some locals are definitely missing, but these are the vans you're seeing here. So AHF, Care Resources, Florida Health, Empower You, Berinquin, et cetera. And these are some of the supervisors and testers. We all, one thing you'll note that is we try to make it um, Fun, right? Because what we exude in terms of what we're doing as a team will also impact whether or not people view us as approachable or wanting to engage with us. And these are some of the images of the pictures taken from pre-COVID um, as well of the team members. You won't see images of individuals just because for privacy reasons, um, we don't take images of them. But we basically go in, partner with the businesses and figure out with the businesses what makes more logical sense for us in terms of setup and execution. And so the image at the bottom and the middle, you'll notice that we're actually set up on the side of a parking lot and then the Berinquin van is right behind that. The store was um, to, um, towards the front of where we're set up, but that's where it strategically made sense, again, in collaboration with the business for us to set up and engage with individuals. So from the five point, um, the one year five point initiative, there were a lot of lessons that um, we took away from that. During the, the one year, which was actually interrupted by COVID, I think, six months in, but we were able to conduct over um, 
10 events, 13 events, and partnered with um, 10 community health organizations. At that point, we only had two consultants, but we engaged over 600 individuals um, in these communities. Um, and again, primarily Black individuals, and we're able to get a lot of um, important kind of qualitative data from individuals and from the businesses that spoke about the fact that this model resonated with them. This idea that everyone who showed up had something that they would walk away with. Um, and it was important for the residents to know that when they come to these events, what happened is that um, they engage with my team and we give them a tablet. Um, nowadays, we have it where they could scan a QR code and they do a brief survey. Um, they're provided with information on PrEP and they're offered HIV testing. Um, that was in year one, they were offered HIV testing and then they got a voucher to then use and spend in the business immediately. So everyone at the table is getting a value in that the residents are getting a voucher to spend in the business immediately. The business is increasing then their income for that particular day. The community health partners are coming in and have a pre-organized event where they could actually um, then be able to, um, to conduct testing. And so we learned that, you know, people like the approach because everyone was valued at the table um, and that led to, um, to really positive feedback. Lessons we learned, I think, comes with community-based participatory or engaged research and that there are institutional bottlenecks that can make the process sticky in terms of working out certain kinks, but we've been able to walk through those and continue to build the relationships. The two-year project, building on the first year, um, again, expanded things to 12 zip codes. We are aiming to execute 60 outreach events of this type over the next um, um, year and a half. We've already gone at, um, about a couple months into it and we've already done several events and have um, many more planned. HIV testing, um, they have to do the testing in order to get the voucher this time around. Initially, it was only optional to get the testing. But also in the context of COVID with the second year, um, two year EHE, um, there are other things that are built into it. So there are a lot of safety precautions, obviously, but making sure that our warmth and um, likability transcends a mask. We're also offering COVID testing through our community um, partners. So EmpowerU is able to conduct um, COVID testing on site. And so we're offering both HIV testing and COVID testing, and we're gathering information on COVID impact and also people's views on the vaccine. Um, though this is just an acknowledgement to say that there are many people at the table giving information, um, working to support this project, the residents, the businesses, consultants, the organizations, my team, CHARM, and also the funding agencies. Sorry, thank you, uh, Dr. Dale. That was awesome. Um, unfortunately, given the way the day is going, we are not able to do questions and answers for the um, for these rapid fire uh, EHE presentations. But if people do have uh, questions or for Dr. Dale, I'm sure she would be uh, happy to answer them over email, which um, is available just by Googling her or looking at the CHARM website. Um, we, oh, I guess, and also David Johnson is saying during the discussion forum at 11.45, you may also ask questions. So we have a very short break, a five minute biological break. Um, oh no, wait, let's see, 10.25, 10.15, a 10 minute, a 10 minute break. So please keep your 10 minute break to 10 minutes and we will be back at 10.25 to hear from one of my other favorite people in the whole world, Mariano Kanamori. Um, okay, well, I guess I will take over and um, introduce our next speaker. So welcome back, everybody. Um, again, another favorite person in the world, and it's just really great to see um, junior investigators who are emerging and have emerged to being mid-level investigators, I guess, but getting national and inter international recognition for their work, which is really important. And uh, Dr. Kanamari and also Dr. Dale are both just so dedicated to trying to reduce the impact of HIV. So anyway, Mariana Kanamori is an epidemiologist with 26 years of research experience, designing, developing, and implementing and evaluating HIV interventions for socially and economically marginalized Latino communities, including Latino, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men in Miami-Dade County. His work includes program design, implementation, and evaluation of social network interventions in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the and the US. 
Um, he, in more than 30 projects funded by the National Institute of Health and uh, USAID. So uh, he is also one of our EHE supplement uh, recipients for ending for ending the epidemic. That's what EHE stands for. And uh, I'm delighted to, to have him give a talk. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> and thanks for being such a great mentor. So today I'm going to present finishing as HIV. So uh, most implementation science programs focus only on Latino men who self-identified as gay. However, in our uh, social network study, we found that there is an overlap, an overlap between sexual risk networks of Latino MSN who self-identify as gay and those who self-identify self as bisexual or straight. And we also found that there is no PrEP use disclosure during sexual encounter with a Latino MSN who self-identify as bisexual or straight. So men who have said sex with men, with men and women, are the bridge between MSN in whom the epidemic is concentrated and the general population. This is the result of another study. So here, each blue polygon represents an area where Latino MSN here in Miami have sex or find a sexual partner. So what we can see here is that they are having sex and finding sexual partners all over the country. And this is not surprising to me because now with the technology, it's kind of easy to find a sexual partner. So for this reason, the objective of finishing HIV is to reach large numbers of Latino MSM self testifies as gay, as well as bisexual or straight throughout Miami-Dade County. So finishing HIV fills this research gap through an innovative and tailored implementation science model for reaching large numbers of Latino MSN, regardless of their sexual self-identity. So finishing HIV uses the re-aim and the CIFER models. These are implementation science models to first evaluate rollout, second, understand barriers and facilitators to successful implementation, and third, document progress and lessons learned through ongoing monitoring and process evaluations. So finishing HIV addresses three pillars, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. It is implemented in Miami-Dade County, and it has developed uh, by many um, centers here at UN, as well as uh, partners in the community. So this is uh, finishing HIV. So finishing HIV includes four networks, the social network, the radio network, the park network, and the pharmacy network. And the aim of this network is to increase awareness and utilization of HIV services. So now I'm going to describe each network. So let's start with the social network. So the partner for our social network is Latino Salud. And the goal of this network is to identify factors and agents responsible for the successful implementation of social activities which inform and recruit Latino MSM self-identified as gay for HIV services. So we have different entertaining, entertainment events, such as gaming nights, food bazaars. We also have galas and festivals and focus discussion groups. So now let's talk about the radio network. And our partner for the radio network is Radio Addictiva. So the aim of this network is to assess the appropriateness of using different types of Latino influencers. For example, religious influencers, sport influencers, public health influencers, you know, for the broadcast of PrEP messages. And this is for the general Latino population. And the Radio Dictiva has uh, the potential to reach over 270,000 Latinos per month all over Miami-Dade County. And one of our, um, um, activities that we have with the radio is the creation of a radio soap opera. And as a Latino radio soap opera, we will have a lot of drama because without drama, a radio soap opera will not be successful. So I hope that you are going to be tuned and we are going to listen every chapter of our radio soap opera. So now I'm going to talk about the Parks Network. So the aim of this Park Network is to detect contextual facilitators and barriers to the implementation of the park network. 
So in this picture, this is a picture of the drive-through launch event. Okay, and we did it in Homestead, and we have um, we were able to distribute 150 of these flyers. So this is um, the flyer that was developed to, for this event, and we can say the text started with "Le presentamos finishing HIV." You know? So it was very, um, I guess, motivating for the community. And in addition, we have identified several high traffic areas for our outreach activities. And here, we are going to distribute comprehensive sexual health education material focused on PrEP for two Latino males, regardless of their sexual safe identity. We have um, presented this project to um, different corporations and they are supporting us. So we will be able to distribute these nice uh, sport bags to uh, at least 800 um, Latinos here in Miami. So we hope that this is going to be a fashional bag and, we will, and people will be able to see um, what is finishing HIV, they're going to uh, wonder what PrEP is. And finally, I am going to talk about the pharmacy network. And the partner for our pharmacy network is CVS and Pharmacia Navarro. So the aim of this network is to identify facilitators and barriers to implementing an EHE project reaching the general population, I mean a large population that involves a corporate partner. So we are actually distributing these flyers in non-clinical and discrete settings. So somebody can just go to a pharmacy to find out more about PrEP or to have their PrEP prescription. And if they find a friend, they can just tell, okay, I'm here uh, because I want to buy my shampoo. They don't need to disclose anything. So the flyer in the middle is something that now we are distributing at CVS and Pharmacy Navarro, and it includes contact information. Uh, of the services that are available, uh, Latino Salud, so, because there are many people who are who may be already ready you know, to, to find information. However, now we are also going to distribute the other flyer that is in the right. And in this flyer, we are providing PrEP information because many Latinos here in Miami do not know anything about PrEP. So we are covering these two, uh, these two areas. And now in the next phase, we are going to include these PrEP messages in the CVS receipt and coupon. So now it's going to be useful to me because sometimes we receive all of these long uh, receipts and we don't know what to do with them. So now at least we are going to use it for something, for a public health campaign. We are also going to have posters that will be placed inside the stores and also outside the doors. And we are going to include these PrEP messages in the weekly sales advertising. So we are expecting uh, to reach over 8,000 Latino clients per year. So in the map uh, located in the left, you see several dots. So the dots represent activities from the, uh, the, red, uh, the, the networks um, and and in the right, we perform an accessibility analysis. So what we can see here in this analysis is that finishing HIV will be able to reach and engage large number of Latinos all over Miami. And this is important because we need to reach this population and large number of this population to end the HIV epidemic in Miami. And finally, I want to present this logic model. So this logic model um, I don't going to describe the logic model, but I just want to show the level of complexity of the project and for both the implementation part and the evaluation part. So it's very complex and comprehensive. Okay, it's a very uh, comprehensive evaluation um, plan that is behind um, finishing HIV. So thanks. Um, so thanks so much. Um, thanks so much. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mariano. That was uh, that was excellent. So um, I believe now, um, Dr. Stevenson, you will be introducing the next speaker. Yeah, thanks, Steve. <clears throat> so uh, it's my very great pleasure to welcome uh, as our next speaker, Emma Spencer, uh, who is currently chief of the Bureau of Communicable Diseases for the Florida Department of Health. Um, and uh, Dr. Spencer has over 10 years experience as an academic researcher uh, in the field of nitrogen biogeochemistry and in her current role as Bureau Chief of Communicable Diseases 
She serves as principal investigator of multiple research uh, and surveillance programs. She manages grants and budgets and has a broad background in applied public health research, epidemiology, and data analysis. <clears throat> Dr. Spencer has a vested interest in understanding health disparities, stigma, and the unmet needs of persons living with HIV and HCV, uh, and has designed a research program to address these issues, as well as aligning <clears throat> with department strategic plans and the national HIV prevention strategy and improving disease surveillance. <clears throat> and uh, Dr. Spencer and her department uh, enjoys a, a close working relationship with some of the investigators here at the University of Miami. We're very uh, happy to, to have her uh, address us today. Uh, the title of her presentation is How Molecular Epidemiology Can Assist in Ending the HIV Epidemic in Florida. Emma, the podium is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you so much um, for that uh, introduction and thank you uh, for inviting me to present today um, and to share um, some of the work that we've been doing, um, both as a collaboration and what the Florida Department of Health is uh, able to do. I'm going to just turn my video off if you don't mind. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about the RESPOND pillar within the uh, EHE initiative. I'll discuss how this pillar and molecular epidemiology can be effective and help us towards ending the HIV epidemic in Florida and some of the things that we have done with this work. Just a few disclosures. Um, I would just like to point out that the data um, provided in this presentation is provisional and subject to change. Um, just a very brief outline of my presentation. Um, I will be uh, briefly describing the EEG initiative um, and the state of the epidemic based on the final data from 2019 in Florida. I will then talk about molecular epidemiology in the context of public health and surveillance um, and the analysis efforts in Florida, providing some information on the collaborations we have with the University of Miami group, um, identify any issues uh, currently with molecular epidemiology, and some next steps for the states and the uses of these data. One of the main reasons uh, we are here uh, these past few days is to highlight the great research and implementation science that's being taking place to address how we may end the HIV epidemic. As we know, the EHE initiative will use these four pillars as strategies to target our resources to the 48th highest burden counties, Washington DC, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and seven states with a substantial rural HIV burden. Florida has seven counties of high HIV burden, and I'll provide a little epidemiological context to the state of the HIV epidemic in Florida and these seven counties, and then focus the rest of the presentation on how we are able to use molecular epidemiology to respond to rapidly growing transmission clusters and provide prevention and treatment services to those who need them. In 2019, 4,000, 584 Floridians were diagnosed with HIV. At the end of that year, nearly 117,000 Floridians were living with diagnosed HIV. And using uh, CDC estimates, the actual number of people living with HIV in Florida may actually be around 135,000. Florida has seen a continual decrease in, in both the number and rate of persons with a new HIV diagnosis, but despite that, we remain in the top three states in the nation for both rates per 100,000 population and new diagnoses. However, in 2019, we actually did see a 4% decrease from 2018 to 2019 for the number of new diagnoses. The blue bars here um, on the graph actually represent a hypothet hypothetical estimation of where we need to be in the next five and 10 years in terms of rates in order to be successful with this initiative and in order to end the epidemic in Florida. These data um, primarily show how large of a decrease we need to obtain in order to meet that goal um, in the next five to 10 years. Uh, just a little caveat, they're hypothetical and they don't consider any changes in population or the impact of prevention and care services and activities um, that we're hoping to implement with the EHE initiative. 
as you can see, we do have quite a way to go. These are the seven counties uh, identified in phase one of the EHG plan. Um, as you can see, these large metropolitan areas have high incidence of those new, newly diagnosed, with Miami and Broward having the largest numbers of new diagnoses in 2019. Over 70% of persons living with HIV reside in these seven counties, and Florida accounts for just over 12% of the total burden of HIV in the United States. Despite the high number of new diagnoses and high rates of HIV, Five of the seven counties had a decrease um, between 2018 and 2019. So it seems like we're moving in the right direction. One of the main goals is for those who are currently living with HIV are retaining care and maintain continuous viral suppression, as this has been proven to reduce HIV tr transmission for those um, transmission events between partners. And it's over 99% effective um, at reducing. Um, transmission sexually and 74% effective for persons who inject drugs. Therefore, we want to make sure that we can provide those services and actually help persons with HIV achieve and maintain viral suppression. Here in Florida, we have a statewide viral suppression rate of 68%. That's that blue bar on the left. Um, and most of the EHE counties are at or above that rate. However, we still have a large out of care population, which is approximately 30% of the 117,000 persons living with HIV um, in Florida who contribute to that lower rate overall. Molecular epidemiology, along with other public health interventions, can assist with uh, identifying and finding persons who need linkage to care and other services. For your reference, all of the sequence data we receive from routine genotypic HIV-1 resistance testing is done using the Paul region of the HIV genome. Here you can see uh, in the red circle. We typically only use the reverse transcriptase and the protease region and not the integrate, integrase region in our analyses. Within epidemics such as HIV, certain subgroups defined by the specific clinical, demographic, or behavioral factors um, may contribute disproportionately to the rapid transmission of HIV. Historically, these risk factors linked to these high rates of HIV transmission have been identified with other methods, such as surveys, use of partner services interviews, provider notifications to the health department, or basic disease epidemiology and surveillance. These methods really only provide a per act estimate of individual level transmission or acquisition risk. For example, if you take traditional partner services and contact, uh, contact tracing, um, by a disease intervention specialist, they will have to uh, be able to identify, locate, and interview that person diagnosed with HIV. If they're unable to locate them and are unable to solicit any partners for further testing and interventions, we have a gap in the um, uh, transmission network. Generally, each HIV diagnosis yields less than one partner per diagnosis for intervention. Whereas molecular epidemiology and the analysis of HIV gene sequence can actually increase the network size for possible intervention, more so than traditional epidemiology. Recently, these types of analyses have been extremely useful in determining HIV risk networks across the United States and have resulted in positive outcomes for communities across the nation who have experienced acute increases in HIV transmission um, outside of the norm especially amongst persons uh, who inject drugs who are a vulnerable population. Some outbreaks that have, been, have used these analyses and you may be familiar with are listed uh, in the slide, including the infamous Scott County, Indiana outbreak, and even more, um, the uh, Miami-Dade um, syringe service program um, outbreak that we uh, in investigated with uh, Dr. Dukes. Each of these outbreaks that use these genetic sequence data to inform response activities, including um, activities such as testing, PrEP linkage, and linkage to HIV care and other social services, all had positive outcomes in the end in terms of increasing awareness and supporting the, and implementing harm reduction practices amongst persons who inject drugs. Um, these can have been done with just traditional epidemiology due to the time and effort to analyze those data and the lack of direct knowledge of a known network 
especially if you're not able to interview a person within a said network. In the case of Scott County particularly, if these interventions had been in place and these data had been used um, more regularly and available for analysis, then most uh, HIV transmissions could have been prevented. HIV genetic sequences are reported to the health departments um, and they're allowable by uh, our Florida state statutes. And this is standard um, for public health practice in most states in the United States. We've been using these data and refining practices since 2017. However, this is still um, a program that's early in its development, um, but it mirrors other disease programs such as TB, who also use molecular data to identify clusters. We use um, the CDC developed secure HIV trace program that analyzes all sequences using a genetic distance and pairwise analysis to determine relatedness of HIV, HIV sequences a 0.5% genetic distance, which indicates a more recent and rapid transmission, and a longer distance at 1.5%, which indicates um, transmission may have occurred a few more years um, prior. Used with other methods such as general surveillance data, partner services information, and other information to compare these HIV genetic sequences, um, we're able to identify groups of related HIV transmission and outbreaks. This method is actually very cost effective and less invasive tool for identifying the most rapid transmission of HIV within these risk networks where other epidemiological data may actually be incomplete. Following these analyses, we will respond through several mechanisms to reduce the further transmission of HIV in the community and within individual risk networks. We use the statewide data to care linkage program um, to uh, link individuals as part of a molecular cluster to HIV care so that we can hopefully um, achieve, uh, allow them to achieve viral suppression. Our DIS for partner services um, uh, also are engaged um, in identifying individuals and molecular clusters. Uh, and then we also engage the community at more higher level um, actions for high burden uh, areas. And um, one of those, uh, projects will be discussed. We have a database of over 70,000 sequences that we've been collecting since 2009, and we've received more every day. However, we have an indicator that at least 60% of those diagnosed with HIV should have a HIV sequence that we can analyze. As you can see though, we've had a decline in the number of genotypes that we've received over the past seven years. Since we actually have been actively collecting and receiving these sequences, there may be seven, uh, three potential reasons, which may be due to uh, an individual not entering HIV care. They may have entered HIV care, but had no drug resistance testing. They may have entered HIV care and had drug resistance testing, but no sequences were provided to um, the department to use for surveillance purposes. Without these data, there will be obvious gaps in network analyses, which is why these are best used in conjunction with other methods that we've discussed previously. As I stated, these molecular analyses are best used um, in conjunction with other practices that will help us drive and enhance individual level interventions and that they are used to provide shorter timeframes uh, for us to be able to link individuals to care, offer partner services or offer prep. It'll also help with monitoring outbreaks amongst the vulnerable populations, such as our persons that, uh, who inject drugs. The next couple of slides will detail the special projects that we have at the community level. And um, we wouldn't be able to conduct these analyses without building these strong relationships and sharing data as appropriate. Um, so very grateful for those uh, collaborations. Um, and some of those are listed below here. The University of Miami uh, Mobile Prep, which you heard about from Dr. DeBlecky Lewis yesterday. Um, we are working with Duval County on a mobile testing unit um, that's in the planning stages right now. I mentioned before that we um, worked with Dr. Tukes um, with the UM idea exchange on an investigation. And uh, we're also working with uh, the Orlando uh, EMA Ryan White planning body. Um, 
In the past three years, uh, we've had 39 clusters of related HIV, which were identified as ever rapidly growing. Um, rapidly growing is indicated as um, five new diagnoses within a 12 month period. Um, so as you can see, they're distributed quite a lot um, amongst the uh, EHE counties, 73% uh, of clusters occur in those uh, counties. At present, um, as of uh, the beginning of February, we still have five clusters that meet the definition of rapid growth. Um, so included in those five, uh, eight clusters, sorry, um, those, uh, those 236 individuals who are across those eight clusters. In 2018, uh, we were actually alerted by Dr. Tooks, um, uh, who was at the time uh, the, the medical director for the first legal syringe service program in Florida. Um, we now have a few more, which is great. Um, and uh, they alerted us after they had um, implemented their routine screening efforts and identified 10 anonymous uh, HIV serum conversions. We actually collaborated with them to conduct a further epidemiological investigation and identified seven true uh, zero conversions. Six of the seven were actually epidemiologically and or socially linked to at least one, uh, two other zero conversions. So that's the green um, squares or circles on the graph. An analysis of uh, any HIV genotypes that we had revealed that two individuals um, were connected molecularly at 0.5% genetic distance that indicates that recent and rapid transmission. And that is the other, those are the blue lines. Um, others were linked at the larger genetic distance of 1.5% and those are represented by the uh, red lines. Since they weren't all linked through molecular analyses, we identified a risk network with uh, complex transmission dynamics that could not be explained by epidemiological methods or molecular analyses alone, but um, we didn't have all of the genotypes available for everybody in the network, unfortunately, um, as some had achieved uh, viral suppression pretty quickly following uh, their linkage to care um, by the SSP. Um, we also did use uh, some of the um, resistance analysis data that we received um, along with the sequence data, and we were able to determine if any of the individuals had similar resistance mutations, and that enhanced some of the missing sequence data that we have. Miami, as we know, uh, is a high HIV burden county, accounting for more than 25% of the new diagnoses um, in Florida in 2019. Um, we partnered with Dr. DeBlecky Lewis's group to enhance the location of her PrEP delivery mobile to reach areas where risk networks have been identified and provide services in that area. The map depicts the density of people belonging to the HIV risk networks. Um, it includes those identified as belonging to a molecular HIV cluster, uh, any partners living with HIV associated with the risk networks so that would have been identified through partner services and those identified as being at risk um, for exposure to HIV. The color gradient um, actually corresponds to the density of the network members associated with those um, identified at 1.5% uh, genetic distance over the past um, two years um, for a cluster that was once rapidly growing. The definition for rapidly growing, as I mentioned before, is at least five new diagnoses within the past 12 months. And these networks are important because they can transmit HIV 11 times more than regular transmission per person. We provide data to uh, Dr. DeBlecky's group on a quarterly basis, and we are working on trying to refine and improve what we can send to inform further this project. So the next few slides are really just pretty network diagrams that I wanted to show, and I won't discuss in too much detail. Um, but I wanted to show what we can glean from these analyses in conjunction with demographic and risk information that we received through HIV case surveillance, along with viral suppression knowledge, partner services information, and whether or not someone received a partner services interview, and the geographical location uh, of where they were diagnosed and currently living. We can tailor our response to intervene in these clusters. Um, this is the current network that is uh, primarily male, Hispanic, Latino, MSM. 
Um, but as you can see, it's pretty diverse. The length of the gray lines represents the genetic distance from the nodes who connect to each other. And these are all within 0.5% of the genetic distance. Uh, this one is primarily a black MSM with a tight network structure, as you can see. And this one is a network in a high priority, it's the high priority network because it involves persons who inject drugs who are both male and female. And this one is a smaller cluster, but it's slightly complex. Um, it involves different groups, including both heterosexual male, female, and MSM. So major challenges still exist. Um, uh, to us to be able to uh, complete these analyses and, and make sure that they um, allow us to, to do the work that we need to do. One of the main takeaways from this is really um, about the fact that we do have a lot of missing data. Um, and one of those uh, issues is due to the fact that we rely on um, providers to follow clinic, HRSA clinical guidelines to order a baseline drug resistance test at the time of diagnosis, as well as relying on um, the uh, laboratories to report those as per statute. Um, so again, another one of our big challenges is uh, the, uh, we have to consider um, ethics when we are using these data. Um, a, a lot of our community focus groups have um, and across the nation have actually focused on whether or not um, we need to consider the appropriate use of these data. If consent is warranted, we should also um, consider the fact that um, there is a uh, HIV criminalization statute um, in Florida. The state of security and, and privacy of these information, um, stigma associated with um, these analyses, uh, and then other uh, public health um, consumers and concerns. So as we um, respond, pillar is one of the steps in the EEG plan that links um, with all of the other pillars. We have some next steps that we'd like to take to enhance our state's infrastructure to rapidly detect and respond to regions and networks of rapidly growing HIV transmission and other diseases such as hepatitis C um, and hepatitis A. These are just some of the key strategies within our ending the epidemic plan. I'm not going to uh, describe them all, um, but the whole plan should be available on the website soon. Um, and uh, we uh, have reached a consensus with our current uh, community advisory group and our planning network. Um, but if you have any additional feedback going forward, uh, we would appreciate that. As this uh, ending the HIV epidemic initiative is a group effort. So I just would like to acknowledge um, a few folks. Uh, there's a lot of individuals who um, take part in this Ending the Epidemic Initiative. Um, and uh, I just would like to say thank you again for allowing me to present to you today. Thank you, Dr. Spencer. That was terrific. Um, so we, we, we have time for um, questions. And uh, just for, for those on the, on the, the, the site, um, please, when you're, when you're interested in asking a question, you can post it in the Q&A. And um, even for, for, for speakers who are about to, to come, we're, we're gonna have a discussion, uh, a moderate, uh, table moder uh, moderators panel um, afterwards. So you can post your questions ahead of time. So Dr. Spencer, um, you know, the, 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 the model that's being used here, you know, was originally um, pioneered by, you know, Vancouver. Um, um, and, you know, they saw dramatic, they saw dramatic impact of targeting uh, prevention um, services to the, the clusters, the infection clusters. Mm -hmm. Do you think the model is generally transplantable? I mean, have you seen similar impact with targeting um, uh, prevention services to those clusters uh, to the same extent that they've, they've observed in Vancouver? Or do we face sort of unique challenges here in South Florida that they didn't have in Vancouver? Um, yes, I think there it depends on uh, the population that you are um, trying to um, offer an intervention towards. Um, I feel when we worked very closely with the syringe uh, exchange program in Miami, 
that that model, we embedded a DIS, we worked very closely, they had community relationships, and it was a lot easier to see the outcomes. Um, for the, the larger networks that we have, which are predominantly MSF, um, trying to evaluate those outcomes um, are particularly hard. Um, we rely still heavily on our disease and prevention specialists to um, locate, interview, offer services, um, identify partners. Um, so even though we have this information, um, using it directly um, at an individual level is pretty tough um, because Florida, I think, has, um, there's, if you, I didn't show a, 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 a map, but um, if you were to look at our transmission networks, they span the whole state. So you may have a cluster in um, Miami, but really it's actually, so we would say that it originated in Miami because 50% or more individuals live currently in Miami or were diagnosed there. But when you look at that whole network, there's um, dots or, or cluster members all over. And so that makes it very hard to, um, we'd have to do a lot of cross-jurisdictional work. So when you have something that's more localized, I think these data really, really help. If you have these larger networks, um, you really need to get the community involved and increase messaging, testing, access to prep. So in that point, one of the questions is, as an HIV care provider, how can that provider be alerted to the to a cluster outbreak in that person's area so that they can assist in the response? Um, we're hoping to do some more messaging. We're hoping to send out some health alerts um, to local areas and local providers. Um, hopefully that will engage uh, our community-based organizations and FQHCs and uh, private providers to be able to recognize that they need to do increased screening, testing, linkage to care. Um, and so a lot of that comes down to what we should share um, at the health department level. And then we have a question, um, which I think you've, you've, you've touched on, which is the, the confidentiality. And, you know, you're asking um, newly diagnosed individuals to contact their sexual partners to alert them to potential, you know, a potential exposure. Um, so how, how, how do you deal with this, the, with that issue and how, how big of a challenge is that issue in terms of really uh, using this targeted intervention to, to um, uh, combat the epidemic? So from the perspective of public health, um, contact tracing, and, and everybody's heard about that now because of COVID, um, but that's a standard practice, especially uh, for um, HIV and, and STDs. Um, typically, once we receive a new diagnosis through surveillance efforts, um, our disease intervention specialists are alerted of that uh, individual through a secure data system. They are Department of Health individuals. And by statute, they um, are responsible for uh, mitigating disease by uh, locating those individuals and trying to, um, I'm sorry, that's my turn. And, and uh, mitigate disease um, uh, by uh, anonymous, contacting the individual and saying, uh, you recently received a diagnosis. Um, uh, they talk through, uh, you know, they build a rapport with that individual and then they ask, um, please, can you tell us about your partners? Um, we will then anonymously contact them and say, you may have been exposed uh, and uh, offer those services. It is their right to refuse. And with molecular epidemiology, since we are looking at related strains of HIV, not individuals, um, it is the same principle. We would use that same mechanism. Thank you, Dr. Spencer. That was terrific, and thanks for you know bringing your experience uh, to to uh, to this to this symposium. Uh, without much further ado, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Dr. Pawa, who will introduce the next speaker. Hey, thank you, Dr. Spencer. That was really terrific. Thank you. We now come to the last of our own EHE research presentations. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Alan Rodriguez, Professor of Clinical Medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases 
uh, with secondary appointments in the Department of Public Health Sciences and in the School of Nursing and Health Studies at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. He has leadership roles in the Miami CIFAR as the director of the Biobehavioral and Community Engagement Corps and in CHAM as co-director of the Developmental Corps. Dr. Rodriguez has many research interests and he's actively involved in that he's actively involved in in different various capacities. Beginning in 2016, he developed and leads a rapid treatment program at mm -hmm. UMJMMC Adult HIV Outpatient Clinic and works collaboratively, uh, collaboratively with the Florida Department of Health to increase linkage to ART for achieving faster viral load suppression. With this EHE award, he's systematically documenting barriers and facilitators to the implementation of the rapid treatment program through HIV clinics in Miami-Dade County. Uh, Alan, uh, podium is yours. Oh, good morning, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm gonna be presenting the preliminary results of our administrative supplement. Oh, we got it, great. Okay. Great, so thank you. Uh, I'm gonna present on behalf of my co-investigator, Dr. Michael Colbert, Dr. Uh, Hardness, Dr. Uh, and Dr. Wyziniak. So as a, as a, as an introduction, uh, the Miami Test and Treat Rapid Response Program actually was started and pilot tested at the University of Miami, Jackson Memorial Hospital in 2016. Uh, we started here the, at Jackson, partnering with the Department of Health, and it was uh, gonna be pilot tested in an institution that has a uh, different uh, institutions actually working together, which is a public hospital, an academic center, and a case manager uh, institution, all of them work independently, but together. So we thought if we could do it here, we could uh, then replicate it and do it elsewhere. So the details of the implementation was published on 2019 and in, the in innate behavior, and we were successfully able to start rapid antiretroviral therapy. At that time, it was defined as starting someone within seven days and ideally on the first day. The preliminary results also show that we have a 92% of people achieve viral suppression within 73 days, and now we're looking at the long-term retention of these patients. So uh, we got a CIFAR administrative supplement to actually uh, develop a stakeholder consortium and conduct focus group with consortium members on how uh, was it going with the implementation of this and treat. Because while we were pilot testing back in 2016, the Department of Health contracted with other institutions and replicated uh, the rapid response in many, many federally health qualified and HIV clinics in Miami. Uh, the second aim was informed by the Implementation Science and Coordination Collaboration Center, or ISKIS, from Northwestern, and it was to identify multi-level barriers and facilitator or rapid response treatment and the expansion in Miami-Dade County. And then the third aim of this uh, uh, supplement would be to develop a standard pro protocol or intervention to implement rapid uh, treatment in Miami-Dade County. So, as I said, we were trained and informed by ISKIS, and uh, we provide we did provided focus groups that were in person, and some of them were uh, done uh, remotely uh, once the COVID pandemic started. We also uh, interviewed community members that is newly diagnosed HIV positive patients and enter care to through rapid uh, uh, response or immediate antiretroviral therapy. The idea was to assess the barriers and facilitations of implementation of rapid response in Miami-Dade County. So this is pretty much the, epi the epidemiology of the people that were interviewed and it kind of reflects the epidemiology of the newly diagnosed uh, individuals in Miami-Dade, which is uh, the majority are uh, Latino uh, MSM, but we also interview women and black people. Next slide. So basically what we did is uh, we conducted these focus groups and uh, see why it's not moving. And we analyzed the interviews using a pair of coders uh, following the consolidated framework, framework for implementation uh, research or CIFIR. This is a framework that identifies at multi-level levels what can help in the way of uh, 
Okay. Can you see my screen? We see it now, Alan. Okay, so analyzing the interviews, uh, we use a pair of coders and we use the CIFIR uh, network. So this is a network that identify multi, multi, multiple levels that can help and get in the way of an innovation. And pretty much this is analyzed by using five domains, which is the innovation characteristics. Uh, so what patients or stakeholders think about it, the outer setting, what's happening outside the institutions, the inner setting and the characteristics of the individuals and how they are on the process. And pretty much this is the, the preliminary results of this uh, analysis. So, uh, and it's what the patients and stakeholders think of rapid response. So in terms of innovation, the, the people that came through this program believe that it's an effective and preferable to standard treatment, which would be to wait uh, for the appointment. So they prefer to come right away. Also the stakeholders feel it's an effective and preferable way of getting people into treatment. Uh, it simplifies the, the access to for patients and uh, however, the clinic feel that it can be complex to implement, especially at the beginning. This will change the usual routine of a clinic where we have patients that come, you don't know when, and you need to uh, attain, attain to them uh, immediately. So it has to be uh, planned. Uh, in terms of outer setting, uh, external policies can be challenged in Miami transportation, insurances, depending on the insurance, might be a challenge to start antiretroviral therapy on the same days. Uh, also, it is felt that organization that can leak immediately People that organizations that do their own HIV testing or have a formalized relationship with clinics uh, make it easier for the patient versus someone that is a standalone uh, HIV testing site. Uh, also, the stakeholders feel the same way. Stakeholders also think that cultural and contextual factor, factors can impede access. That means uh, providers believe uh, also uh, a stigmatization the, of the patients. And stakeholders also feel that insured patients are harder to link to rapid treatment as opposed to a right and white patient or insured patient where the process is more smooth. In terms of the inner settings, inner settings patients feel that when they get a holistic approach, uh, which is compassion and warmth that was critical for engagement in care in the future. And also since so many things happen on that day of a diagnosis, confidentiality and privacy uh, are important and they need to feel that this is a, a threat. Uh, Clinics feel or stakeholders feel that we need to have a well-established protocol that accounts for the complex eligibility situations and highly effective communication and flexibility throughout the organization from the registration to the case manager to the provider. And leadership has to be on board or invested as clinic administrators or medical directors. Uh, in terms of uh, characteristics of individuals, as it was mentioned yesterday, mental health substance abuse need to be accounted for when a newly diagnosed patient comes into clinic because they may interfere with rapid access. Also, uh, uh, patient readiness, even though our experience is that most patients are ready to start immediately, there are some situations where the patient is not ready to start antiretroviral therapy that day. Uh, the stakeholder feel that in spite of protocol, the providers and administrative staff need to be flexible and committed to meeting the patient needs. And be knowledgeable about uh, rapid treatment, what, uh, how is it uh, done, what tests need to be done, and what uh, medications can be prescribed on rapid treatment. Uh, in terms of the process, the ex patient's experience for the most part is felt that they, they've been effectively executed, uh, but they, they feel that there is insufficient approach in the uh, and outreach in the community, and that comes from some patients that were diagnosed either at urgent care or a private clinic where they were not offered rapid response, and they were offered rapid response when the health department contacted them once they got the diagnosis of HIV uh, reported. Uh, all the stakeholders agree that having a patient navigator, uh, uh, someone that would help uh, navigate this patient through the through the, and the clinic through the whole complexity uh, of. Of, of getting into treatment on the diagnosis, diagnosis is critical for implementing rapid treatment. Uh, but, and everybody feels that they have been able to implement it as, as, as some degree, but that there's always room for improvement. So from our findings, these are the potential implementations for linking patients to rapid treatment, uh, conduct training, uh, which would be clinic specifics, help a clinic establish workflows that are flexible and specific to patients' needs, formalize relationship between organizations, so uh, to ensure referral to rapid treatment and enhance outreach and messaging about the availability of rapid treatment throughout the community. Uh, 
thank you very much. I want to thank uh, all our partners uh, on getting people in antiretroviral therapy on the same day of diagnosis. Thank you, Alan. I that was terrific. And now we go over to Mario to introduce our last speaker for the day. Thank you, Savira. Thank you, Alan. So we are in for a treat, and it is my great pleasure to welcome as our next speaker, Dr. Dennis Burton of the Scripps Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Burton is the chair and professor in the Department of Immunology and Microbiology and holds the James and Jesse Minor Chair in Immunology at Scripps Research Institute. Dr. Burton received his BA in Chemistry from Oxford University in England and his PhD from Lund University in Sweden in the area of physical biochemistry. He is Scientific Director of the IAVI Neutralizing Antibody Center, Director of the Consortium for HIV AIDS Vaccine Development, also known as CHAVI-D at Scripps Research Institute. And he is a member of the Raygon Institute of Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard in Boston. He has held many research grants from the NIH and has published more than 450 papers in scientific journals. He has received numerous awards, including the Jenner Fellowship of the Lister Institute, and is, he is a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology. His research is focused on infectious diseases and in particular the interplay of antibodies and highly mutable viruses uh, notably HIV. He's interested in the potential of broadly neutralizing antibodies to inform vaccine design. And the title of his presentation today is the Scripps Center for HIV and Vaccine Development <clears throat> uh, Approaches to an HIV Vaccine. Dr. Burton, the podium is yours. Okay, thanks very much, um, Mario. Uh, appreciate it. So I had my... Um, uh, second COVID shot yesterday and um, I told Mario about that and he he, uh, he told me it would be fine because old folks like uh, me and him and Ron didn't react much to the vaccine. Well, <laughs> I, I can't quite agree with that. I feel like a bus has hit me this morning, but um, I guess it'll be, I'm, I'm told it goes over quite quickly. So anyway, I'll do my best. And this is um, really an overview of the, the scripts charged and really um, a, an attempt in a, a time to um, explain our um, approaches uh, to uh, an HIV vaccine, the, the, the main kind of features. So the overarching goal of, of our charged and the primary criterion for success is to develop a sequential vaccine regimen that induces sustained protective levels of uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies. And um, we propose to do that in a series of aims. And I would say that most in the field working on this kind of a vaccine now adopt some sort of approach that looks like this, which is that you target each of the individual sites recognized by broadly neutralizing antibodies um, with separate sets of uh, immunogens, and then you look to combine those in, in your final vaccine, if you like. And uh, that's what we're doing, and we're most advanced. So these are the, this is the HIV envelope um, spike, the, uh, the trimer in gray, and then you can see FABs, this is an EM picture, um, you can see FABs bound at various sites. And the site that we're furthest advanced on is the uh, CD4 binding site. Uh, and then the um, V3 glycan site, and then the V2 apex. So we're kind of uh, looking to, to do, to, we're following all three of these. And then we also, and um, other consortia do, like the Duke Charved and the VRC, are looking at um, some of these other sites as well as we are, and we're all kind of watching to see how things go with these sites, which may eventually um, uh, replace one of these others. And the overall uh, aim here is, as I already said, is to put uh, probably three of these uh, sets of immunogens together and create, and you'll see AIM-5 there, 
uh, create a, um, a, a vaccine that induces um, broadly neutralizing antibodies to multiple sites as we uh, think will be required. Um, so the major concepts that, uh, that, that, that we're following in this vaccine design, first of all, reverse what we call reverse vaccinology 2.0. So the sites that we're targeting are identified by broadly neutralizing antibodies to those sites from natural infection. And we like to have as many neutralizing antibodies to those sites as possible for uh, design. Um, because then you're not restricted to uh, maybe, let's say, one particular angle of approach for an antibody. You're, you're looking for a more general solutions. And again, I think the field has bought the notion that you need sequential vaccination. You can't just take one immunogen and elicit broadly neutralizing uh, antibodies. And so the general uh, feeling here is that what you need to do is, first of all, design immunogens that kick off from precursor B cells, the right type of, of antibody response. That will generate for you memory B cells. You then come with um, further immunogens in the process we call shepherding. So shepherding of affinity maturation. So you now uh, push the antibodies towards breadth and then you finish off or polish with an immunogen or immunogens that um, promote differentiation of memory B cells to plasma cells that go to the marrow and then secrete uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies. And this to a degree, and you'll see somatic hypermutation increases across this um, figure. And of course, these antibodies have a relatively high level of somatic hypermutation. And this is sort of what happens in uh, natural infection. You encounter multiple different envelope shapes and some people eventually arrive at broadly neutralizing uh, antibodies. And then finally, <coughs> finally in this uh, major concept is the fact that we, um, we, uh, we, 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 well, there's good evidence that native-like trimers are appropriate mimics of uh, HIV functional spikes. And that's a major breakthrough from um, uh, John Moore, O'Hare Sanders, Ian Wilson, Andrew Ward, um, to show that these are uh, good mimics. So unlike monomeric 120, which is not, these trimers are, are pretty good and can be used as polishers, but also at various stages in the sequence. And it's probably just worth one slide to distinguish what we're trying to do from natural infection. So natural infection does start clearly with um, precursor B cells um, making, you know, germ, let's call them germline antibodies uh, to uh, plasma cells making broadly neutralizing antibodies. But this is a very long and tortuous random walk. And many folks who are infected go off the side here and, and don't get there. Um, but one possible, at least um, uh, theoretical approach would be to take key uh, waypoints, make immunogens and try and guide the immune response in this way from there to A to B. Ours is quite different. So we deliberately take and try to design immunogens that will hit the germline or the precursor B cells, take them along a path um, which um, we hope goes as far as possible. Then when we've got those um, B cells, we can look at them and say, well, what immunogen will now take us further towards um, uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies? And um, so, you know, we have a series of steps like this and we refer to this as a, um, <clears throat> as a reductionist approach. And so the key features of immunogen design, which are particularly the province of Bill Sheaf, Rich Wyatt, to a lesser extent, our lab and um, Andrew Ward, for example, um, the key elements are first of all, to determine the structures of multiple broadly neutralizing antibodies bound to the target. So we know as much as we can uh, find out about the targets. Um, then computational design, 
followed by um, uh, selection of yeast or mammalian display libraries of the designs on multiple antibodies, and then iterative uh, refinement. So this brings you hopefully to the best uh, immunogens. And then you need to assess them. And this is what we've spent a lot of time in the last few years doing. Um, and one of the, the problems that you face is that these immunogens are designed for um, hitting human repertoires or human um, precursors, uh, antibody precursors, which differ a lot even from, from macaques. So you really need human precursors. And the way we've got around that is to knock in mice. And then, of course, you can make those and they have a very high frequency of your precursors, which would be unrealistic for human vaccination. So then we take those um, precursors and dilute them out by adoptive transfer in wild type mice. And then we immunize and see what works. And um, a second approach that we take is to take the immunogens and see what they will fish out of naive human B cell libraries, um, looking for uh, frequencies of uh, precursors. And one of the big questions we've asked is, you know, to what extent will these two approaches predict human responses to the immunogens that we have designed? And um, we can also ask simply for wild type models, how good are they? as predictors. And in fact, you know, the more work we do, the more that we see there's a lot of differences in uh, antibody responses to the same immunogen between different uh, animals. So that's the kind of build up to a lot of basic science. I mean, there's still a lot going on, but we're now entering a phase of uh, clinical studies and we have um, several germline targeting immunogens that are uh, are on the way, started manufacture. We have um, uh, various um, uh, what we'd call polishers, and we're starting to look at the intermediate um, immunogens in that uh, pathway that I showed you. But um, I'm just going to show here germline targeting. And this is the first, and this is really the brainchild of Bill Sheaf and his lab working with many uh, collaborators within the chart to uh, generate in and in within and without to generate um, some conclusions I'm going to show you. So as I said, we're targeting the um, CD4 binding site as our first uh, target, pretty um, somewhat conserved and recognized by this class of antibodies called BRCO1 class antibodies that have certain um, features. And um, if you just take, if you make the, the germline version of um, precursor form of VRCO1, then it won't recognize the trimer. You need to kick off with a different immunogen. And Bill and his team came up with this EODGT8, which is engineered outer domain of GP120 germline targeting version eight. And basically, it's the outer domain with some extra glycans added to try and focus the response onto the CD4 binding site. So it's a piece of the trimer with the CD4 binding site on there. And then it's produced in a um, uh, self-assembling sixtima um, in, uh, in this way so that it's immunogenic. And um, this has been extensively tested um, in, uh, in mouse models. It, it has high affinity for diverse precursors. Uh, it primes the right responses in the um, mouse models that I showed, adoptive transfer, and it induces um, memory responses that look promising to be on the way to breadth. And so um, this uh, clinical trial, um, here, here it is, two doses, um, small number of folks, 20 and 100 micrograms with an ASO1B um, adjuvant. Um, it's the first in human test of germline targeting. Now, I've already said that. The first vaccination was carried out in September 2018, the last in March 2020, and it was conducted at the Fred Hutch and uh, George Washington in um, DC. The primary endpoint was safety. 
but um, major immuno, the major immunological endpoint was to determine essentially if the vaccine worked in inducing VRCO1 class um, B cells. Did it do its job of germline targeting? And as far as we know, this was the first time that the uh, a human um, use of an assay basically looking at sequences of um, uh, induced antibodies uh, has ever been uh, uh, brought forward. And that's due to the extremely hard work of uh, uh, Adrian McDermott and Rick Kaup at the VRC, Krista Cohen, Julie Makaroth at the Hutch. And so these are the major uh, conclusions of that talk. I'm not going to show all the data. Bill did show that some of the data and uh, will be published soon. But here's the major um, conclusions from this uh, initial work. So the, 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 the 60 was safe. It induced um, VRCO1 class responses in 97% of vaccine recipients. So it expanded the B cell precursors exactly as was uh, wanted. And that establishes the print proof of principle for germline targeting. And we're keen on um, uh, following that up in those other um, vaccine targets that I told you about, the V3, uh, the N332, for example. It validates EOD as a candidate for uh, vaccine priming. Sorry. It um, actually, uh, a cautionary note, it suggested that surprisingly high affinities were, were required for targeted priming. So there is a kind of trade-off the lower the frequency of the uh, precursors that you're trying to hit, the, um, the higher the affinities that you need. And that was deduced from, from some mouse studies. And, um, and that's kind of one of the problems with HIV broadly neutralizing antibodies is that the precursors are quite low. So, you know, if some of the antibodies have very long HCDR3s, and um, the precursor frequency is low. So you've got to have very selective immunogens to pull those out of all the mass of different precursors sitting there and, and just waiting to go and um, activate off-target responses. So it provides evidence that boosting induced maturation can be achieved. The, there was evidence that the antibody sequence has gone in the right direction. Um, it provides key reagents because now we have from people the, the B cells that have been stimulated. And so now we can see what will take them along to the next stage. And um, as far as we know, it's the first um, human vaccine trial to confirm intended mechanistic hypothesis. So, you know, we feel that for the first time we've gotten really tight control of an antibody response by... Um, exhaustive design of the, um, the immunogen. And so that's all I'm going to say. I mean, we are working on, as I said, several aims, um, several targets. I thought I would just um, finish off with some um, uh, work on um, basic science out of the, the child. So we're, we're always doing this because um, we feel that getting uh, broadly neutralizing antibody responses is, is, is difficult. It's, it's a tall order and we need from immunogens to get the best antibody responses we possibly can at every stage. And, um, you know, that's one of the difficulties of a sequential vaccine. If it's 90% if it's at st stage one and, you know, 80 at stage two, then it's 70 by the time you get to stage three. So you really need to kind of keep the... Um, the, the success rate up at each step. And that suggests that you've got to maximize responses. And so um, I'm just gonna give three examples of work that we've been doing. And this is just an example of determining um, what sort of titers you needed in NHPs to provide protection through uh, vaccination. Now we couldn't do this with broadly neutralizing antibodies because we can't induce them yet. But we can induce relatively high titers of autologous neutralizing antibodies. So if we immunize with a trimer from BG505, 
and then challenge with Shiv BG505, same strain, then we can look at the conditions of protection. And I just emphasize this study involved 10 uh, PIs from the childhood to actually uh, carry it out. And so here's the result, which is actually quite interesting now in view of, um, well, it's interesting anyway, but it, it, it's interesting, particularly linking now into humans. So what we did was we, um, we uh, vaccinated, we got high titers of neutralizing antibodies, and then we just kept challenging with the shiv. And um, uh, what we figured was at some point, because the antibody titers decline, classically uh, trimatitis decline far faster than we'd like, um, we figured that at some point the titers will fall below some threshold and the animals will get infected. And that's exactly what happened. So once the titers fell, and that's what this shows, once the titers fell below about 500, the neutralizing antibody titers um, measured in um, a pseudovirus assay, then um, the animals became infected. While they were high, they, uh, they did not. And this actually correlates very well with, this is vaccination, immunization. This correlates well with passive uh, protection studies. And this is a, a study um, that compares all the uh, known data from NHP protection and monoclonals where protection greater than 90% requires a, 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 an ID50 of around about 500, very, very roughly. And if you look at the AMP study, um, the latest, um, which is coming out soon in, um, that should be New England Journal, not JEM. Um, the protection for nine, greater than 90% is about 400, very approximately. So all of these numbers are coming out, you know, if you want very substantial protection, you need um, new titers of around about four or 500. Um, if you go down a bit, 75%, it's about 200 uh, from the AMP study, but high, high, relatively high titers. And so we know now what we're shooting for in terms of um, vaccine design. We're, we're, we're looking to induce these sorts of new titers. Um, another area that we've uh, been particularly interested in was how to, we're, we're, we're always worried about off-target responses. It's the total bane of, um, you know, immunogen design for anything like HIV or flu. The virus has evolved so that the antibody responses you make don't do it any damage. It can change and, um, uh, and, and we, we, we need to be able to monitor that quickly. And you know, one way is to make monoclonals, um, and another way is to make a lot of mutants. Um, but the fastest way now has been developed by Lars Hangartner and um, and Andrew Ward, which is MPEM, which is electron microscope polyclonal antibody epitope mapping. And so you make fabs from the sera, and then you just run um, a negative stain EM, and you can very rapidly determine approximately, it's semi-quantitative, um, the patterns of antibody responses. And so here from that last study I showed you, um, we actually compared the um, responses from animals with high new titers, low new titers and, and naturally infected. And there's some overlap, but there's still quite a bit of difference. And the good, uh, the ones that make the best uh, antibodies titer, um, target these uh, regions here most most definitely and we can see that in the MPEM very quickly and then finally another um, uh, approach that we've been uh, interested in we're always looking to you know improve things with uh, adjuvants and different immunization protocols and so on and here's one approach developed by Shane Crotty and Daryl Irvine in particular with a lot of contributions from others in the chart but you can see that if you do a slow delivery immunization with pumps or with escalating dose, then you can get much higher titers, new titers, than you get with bolus. So here's the bolus, just banging it in there, and here's the titer um, if you do a slow delivery. And so we, we don't quite know how to translate that yet into humans, 
uh, for sure, but that certainly seems with trimers to give you better neutralizing antibody um, uh, responses. And if you want to see that dramatically from Daryl here, um, this shows you the, uh, this is an labeled antigen. And if you look at uh, lymph nodes and you look at um, uh, bolus injection, you know, you don't, you're not seeing that much of antigen, but in the slow delivery, there's loads more antigen in the, uh, in the lymph nodes two days post immunization. So, um, you know, all these are, are valuable um, tools in the long term, not only for HIV vaccination, but um, hopefully to, gen to design better vaccines generally. And so um, that was, that's it. And hopefully you recognize some of these folks. I'll just say this is the scientific leadership group of the, um, of the CHARVED, which um, um, makes a lot of the uh, strategic decisions. And then the PIs are um, hopefully folks that uh, a number of you at least will, um, will recognize from um, across the world. Um, so I'm just going to um, race through these. And then, um, of course, our funding is, um, you know, very strongly from the child, and that's what I talked about. But we do have a lot of interactions with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and funding, and they funded the, um, the actual EOD GTA trial. A lot of the basic research was funded by the NIH. Um, and then um, IRV and the, uh, the Reagan Institute. And then finally, just to say that, um, you know, the, the, there's a sort of uh, bringing together of the strategies of a number of different groups now. And there's a strong push uh, driven by um, Tony Fauci to um, uh, share data and bring uh, designs um, um, together. Um, share data very early and uh, really try and work together um, in this um, broadly neutralizing antibody vaccine field. And so this particularly involves the, uh, the two chards, the VRC, um, HVTN and uh, IRV. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. That was really terrific. It's so encouraging to see some real progress um, and not in small part to, um, to, you know, creativity and innovation in the approaches to vaccine. Um, so we're, we're now in a, 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 an open forum, uh, general discussion phase. <clears throat> so please uh, post uh, any questions that you have for any of the speakers this morning. Uh, I'm going to open up with a speaker from, uh, from Ron DeRosie um, for you, Dennis, which is, is there a way that a persisting herpes virus vector system could fit into this complex scheme to get the right kind of antibody, uh, perhaps with long-term maturation? Um, I think it would be very difficult because you don't get the control that we get by doing a series of immunogens. I suspect that you know, the virus will change and you'll, you'll go off course much more often than you go on course. So if we look at, you know, natural HIV infection, probably, you know, one or 2% of, of infected donors make uh, broadly neutralized, potent broadly neutralizing antibodies of the sorts of titer that the AMP trial would say we need to protect. Uh, at least in the absence of um, T cell responses. So I, I think that, you know, anything like that, you know, an, a natural infection will produce a lot of molecules that will veer off and produce a lot of off-target responses. That's what I would guess. And next question is also for you, Dennis. Um, based on the progress that you've been making uh, thus far, and you know some tantalising um, uh, uh, um, snippets of, of of success there. Do do you see a, a timeline for when there may be a vaccine that could be used in the community? Do, not not putting you on the spot because some senior scientists in the field have always, when they're asked that question, say 
three to five years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the length of the the length of the grant that you just applied for. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I would be surprised. I mean, I think what we have to focus on really in humans is proof of principle, and um, you know we have to get to um, generating. Um, broadly neutralizing antibodies of some kind of potency in some percentage of individuals within the next sort of five years ish. Now that's not a vaccine. That's, that just, you know, gives you more and more reason to um, invest more and to, you know, press harder. Um, I think that's probably realistic. Um, but a, a vaccine is probably at least a decade away, at least. Um, I'll, I'll add one caveat here, which has been really, which for us, we've jumped all over and could be great, is the success of mRNA. Right. I mean, because this will allow us to work much more quickly with immunogens if, you know, if it all pans out for HIV trimers and HIV molecules, then uh, envelope molecules, then mRNA could even allow us to do a bit more, it could do some iteration in humans. And so that could, you know, I'm almost factoring that in. I think with, if RNA works out well and things keep going well, I think in five years or so, we could, we could know it's doable. That's what I would put it at. Yeah. And, you know, as an extension to that, what do you think of, some approaches to actually just deliver the antibodies that we have um, yeah. using, you know, yeah. using long-term delivery methods. Do you think there's a, there's a place for that? Yes, I, I, I do. I mean, I think so, you know, that one, that's one of the things we're doing with the VRC. We have a, um, a cocktail of three antibodies that, you know, if they're really potent and you can deliver them subcutaneously, and they have very long half-lives, so they're like half-life extension, so they can get out to six months or even longer, let's say six months. So you'd only need an injection every six months. That, you know, that starts to become feasible. And, and within that realm, you also have bifunctionals, David Ho's bifunctionals, Gary Nabel's trifunctionals. Um, I think all of those things. And then you have B-cell engineering, which is coming along. Um, which at the moment you would say was, you know, uh, fantasy, but um, who knows? I mean, if you could take out a vial of PBMC and, you know, quickly slot in, a, a, you know, five broadly neutralizing antibodies into the B cells and then just expand them through vaccination, who knows? I mean, you know, it, 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 it's plausible. I think the other factor, though, is... The long-acting drugs, you know, I mean, if the long-acting drugs work really well, which they, they they seem to do, then you know the 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 opportunities to use the uh, the antibodies decrease. Um, but still, you know, I mean, antibodies are certainly probably milder than the drugs, but uh, I, I would say it's it's smart to develop all of these things and uh, all of these modalities and see which which makes it. And what about vector approaches to actually just express yeah. the coding regions of the antibody? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's been tried a while ago. Phil Johnson tried um, AAV and, you know, Ron's pursuing um, AAV. And that's, you know, that's a possibility. And then mRNA presentation of, of antibodies, just straight mRNA. Um, that's not given particularly high antibody levels yet, but you know maybe that technology can be tweaked and uh, yeah, I mean I think it's all it's all up to be investigated. So in our lifetime, <laughs> well, we, we, that might be not beyond lunchtime. Though. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Okay, so. Um, uh, Additional questions. Um, we have a question from Jesenia um, regarding Latino Salud Organization. Amazing program. Um, are you trying to expand that program 
around other states or countries? Obviously, that's not a question for you, Dennis. No, <laughs> thank goodness. Uh, um, thanks for this question. Uh, we actually have received uh, funding from NIMH to develop this manual um, that will document uh, our success implementing this project. And this will be available um, to all of the scientific communities so they will be able to replicate this program um, in different places here in the US with Latino communities. And, and why not? They can also do it uh, internationally. But um, we are going to have this specific manual that will help um, other um, organizations um, who are working, that are working with um, Latinos. Um, Thank you, Marianne. So I have a question for, for all of you, um, uh, all of the presenters this morning. Um, might be a tough question, um, and I'm maybe putting you on the spot a little bit, but you know, South Florida, what, what we're seeing here with, with the presentations and with many of the programs is tremendous, tremendous industry, um, uh, uh, novelty in, in addressing the epidemic, but still the numbers continue to increase. And the question is, are we just treading water? Um, are we just keeping pace with these, with these various innovative approaches to, to ending the HIV epidemic? Are we keeping pace here in South Florida? And what is it you think we need to see in order to turn the corner, in order to start seeing you know, significant impact on the number of new infections here in our community? So it's, it's, it's just a question I'd like to open to you. If anyone would like to tackle that question, I'd like to hear from you. I'll, I'll give it a try. I think, um, I think we're doing more than treading water, but I think what's missing is that a lot of the numbers and a lot of the upstream factors aren't being addressed, right? So it is one thing to say to researchers, come in and do something innovative to address the issues that we're seeing, but researchers aren't necessarily policymakers, right? We don't have the reach to upend poverty. We don't have the reach to remove homophobia and racism. And I think that one of the struggles, be it we're doing great work, is that there are structural impacts for these communities who are predominantly impacted that aren't changing overnight. And I think that is part of why you know myself, Mariano, and others are being so creative in terms of how we approach these communities, what we do to engage them and get them connected to care and tested. But there is an upstream impact in terms of the structural factors that aren't being impacted on a global scale, right? We, we do need for zip codes that are now kind of health deserts in terms of the reach and distance that people have to go to to get to clinic and to get to care to no longer be deserts. Like we need physically located places within communities that people can access um, within close proximity. And so I think that's part of the, the issue um, in terms of the, the, the struggle to make headway with all the work that we're doing. Is headway being met? Yes. However, there are structural forces at play that as individual resources, we do not have the capacity to undo or fix. Yeah, I would like to add that, um, that uh, we need to educate the community. The community does not know that PrEP exists, especially the Latino community, the uh, males uh, who have sex with um, other men, but they believe that they are straight. They don't know anything about PrEP. So first, we need to educate them and tell them that PrEP exists, and then convince them that they should enroll in a PrEP program. No, but we cannot expect that they will enroll in a PrEP program now if they do not know that PrEP exists. Okay, so we need to go step by step. First, we need to educate the population and say that PrEP exists, and then they are going to be ready and they are going to enroll in a PrEP program. I'll add a parallel to that because um, we've done, we give out PrEP information and talk to people about PrEP in the community through the Five Point Initiative, but I also had a study that was funded by a Provost Award called MI Prep, particularly to engage Black women, heterosexual women around Prep. 
And we also found that a lot of women did not know about PrEP. However, women were kind of taken back that the information is there, but it hasn't been brought to their attention, be it through their providers. You know, there's research showing that providers are, are less likely to kind of talk to individuals around PrEP, right? And so people aren't getting the information, but it's not that people don't want the information. In fact, they're often like, what, this exists? What are you talking about? Like, I've never heard of this before, right? And so I think it's getting the information and moving beyond the mainstream ways of delivering it. Like, you know, the big campaigns are great, but is it getting to the community? Is it being delivered in a way that people actually understand? And then when people show up to get PrEP, what does that access look like? I had several women within um, that pilot study I talked about who were eager to get PrEP and got frustrated by the process of getting PrEP. They would show up to these points that were supposed to be there to connect them to PrEP, but spend all day. And one lady said, I had to go get my kids. So I'm like, I can't do this anymore, right? And she got up and left after being there for several hours. So I think it's thinking about how we communicate the information, but how do we remove barriers so that people can actually get it once the information um, is something that they, they, they want, once they know that I wanna get this, I've learned about it, like how do we break down the barriers? And I think you've, you know, illust illustrated that, you know, it, it, that, that we're not talking about a homogeneous population. We're talking about communities. We're talking about geographic and social and ethnic communities that we need, you know, special tailored messages for. Um, and and we've seen we've seen innovation with it with the targeted interventions with, for example, mobile prep. So my next so my next question then is, you know. Um, are there concerns that COVID is setting us back, you know, is, 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 is turning the clock back because it's getting in the way of some of these initiatives or are your programs nimble enough that you're going to be able to maintain them in the face of this, uh, this uh, twin pandemic situation? Well, I, I, I'm just going to say from... Uh, the point of view of, of, of care. I mean, first of all, I want to comment on this on what, what I said before, there's many structural barriers, but the fact is Miami is always being forced. I mean, I mean, these structural barriers exist many places, but it works in Miami. But access to care, as, as it was mentioned, is a challenge. I mean, the HIV provider, uh, providers are disappearing and they're less and less, and the more experts they are, the more become researchers or academicians or also pharmaceutical companies, less, less they care. I think uh, engaging and hol holistic approach and having a provider investment in HIV care or prevention is very important. In terms of the impact of COVID, I know for my initiative on test and treat, the numbers of people being tested in, in Miami dropped a lot uh, uh, during 2020. So the people that came to test and treat uh, was, was decreased. Uh, uh, one of the things is, you know, before you could just go walk to STD clinic for a symptom and you get an HIV test uh, during COVID, uh, you know, protocols were in place. You need to make an appointment. It may just make it more difficult to access testing. However, the program is picking up uh, again as, 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 as we take precautions and we're seeing more tests and treat, but I know it did impact. Uh, and I, uh, even though we were available and we, we never really closed in person and uh, especially for, for the newly diagnosed uh, people, but if testing was less, um, less people knew they were HIV positive. There were many uh, organizations in the community that were, are, were no longer providing uh, services. Uh, one exception is Latino Salud. So Latino Salud continue providing um, all of their services. And what happened is that they actually have more clients now. They have more clients because they need to absorb all of these clients from other organizations that could no longer have access to the services. So in this case, the community approach of Latino Salud and the and Latino Salud has more clients now due to um, COVID. I would also add, the last word. Oh. No, sorry. I was I was say that. No, <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, just quickly, I want to say that uh, although definitely agree that COVID has had a significant impact on our um, HIV population and those that risk for HIV, as well as um, hepatitis C and um, STDs in Florida, we did see a, a decrease, especially during the height of the COVID um, pandemic in Florida, um, where we saw a lot fewer people accessing PrEP, um, accessing test and treat, and also testing. 
um, which is to be expected when you can't meet face to face. Um, and a lot of our community based organizations have to um, reevaluate how they did some of their activities, uh, as well did the health department and some of our um, other partners. I think what COVID has actually helped though is that it has increased um, some of the innovation um, to reach certain populations and uh, meet them or, or allow them to do things at home. Um, we've been able to send out at-home test kits. We've been able to do pilot studies on um, allowing individuals to get their uh, three-month HIV and STI testing when they're on PrEP at home. And we've also increased telehealth. And so I think some of those uh, technologies and, and new innovative, well, not new, but uh, innovative strategies have been pushed forward a lot quicker than you probably would have had previously. Uh, and I hope that we'll be able to continue some of those. Also, I think for the health department standpoint, what we've also noticed is that the increased awareness around COVID and contact tracing and the health department and what we are supposed to do um, has helped with uh, us um, being able to locate in individuals who we do receive those uh, positive test results for. Thank you, Ms. So, uh, Sanisha, you went to have the last word? Oh, um, I was going to say that I know of several organizations who still were open when everything shut down and still doing testing, you know, with COVID precautions, Empower You, um, Berinquent. And so there are organizations who were savvy, like Mariano saying, um, let's, you know, salute in keeping people engaged. Um, that said, um, we still need other approaches where we're going out and treating all the pandemics. And I would say that, you know, for some people, it's a twin pandemic in terms of COVID and HIV. But I think HIV researchers, especially who've been in the work around health disparities, know that there are always multiple pandemics there, right? There are pandemics around ism and structural barriers that you're always having to think through and think up against in order to really reach people. So I think that's something that's always um, there and there again, organizations who are able to pull it together and think creatively about how we continue to reach people in the context of COVID. Thank you, Sanisha. Well, we're at the top of the hour and um, on behalf of uh, Dr. Pawa and CIFAR leadership, I'd like to uh, bring this symposium to a close. You know, it's been terrific. Uh, we've uh, seen some, some, some really uh, uh, incredible presentations that um, give me tremendous optimism. I mean, we're, we're facing twin pandemics. Um, and in, in many regards, Miami at, is at the, 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 the front lines of these pandemics. But with the presentations that we've seen, um, it's clear that we have the troops uh, and the weapons that we need to vanquish um, these, these infectious threats to the population. <clears throat> So I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, for, 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 for participating and for sharing their knowledge. Um, it's very important that we, we continue to do this because the, the, the research, the progress is moving so quickly and we always have to keep our eye on the target. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the CFAR administrative team, Amy uh, Stewart and David Johnson um, for uh, uh, providing the materials, organizing the sessions, and keeping the moderators uh, on point. <clears throat> um, it's been a well-oiled machine. Thank you both for, for, for your efforts here. Um, so um, uh, keep up the good work and uh, uh, stay safe, and hopefully we'll be able to get together soon uh, in, in a forum so that we can we can enjoy each other's company, drink, share our ideas, and, and uh, uh, continue on our path. So bye for now. Take care. And I just wanted to add also thanks to Steve uh, Saffron and to Charm, because they co-sponsored the symposium with us. And uh, again, I echo all the sentiments of Mario. Thank you very much. I think it was a great symposium. So I'm really glad it worked out.